Of course, that leads us into our discussion of transportation. Automobiles, the internal combustion engine, will require oil to be separated into lubricant and fuel. Uh, the, the Europeans actually developed the original internal combustion engine, but in the United States, the brothers Charles and Frank Dorea will build the first gasoline-powered car using one of these engines in 1893. Three years later, in 1896, Henry Ford will build his first car. In 1895, there are four automobiles in America. Just four, not four million, not four, thousand, four. In 1917, there are five million. So that tells you just in that short 22-year stretch there, we go from four to five million. Of course, another, another uh, major step in transportation is flight. Flight had always been the dream. Ever since man looked up, he, he dreamed about flying, right? Uh, Balloons were the first uh, real serious attempt by Americans to fly, and this was just filling up a, a sack basically with hot air and lifting up. Uh, Jefferson and Adams had seen one of these in France. It goes, this goes back to the 1770s. The dirigible, which is the, the blimp, had been developed uh, in the early, by the early 1900s. But in 1903, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, two bicycle mechanics, will create the first powered uh, airplane. Uh, their first fly, successful flight will go 120 feet in 12 seconds, but uh, within a year they're able to go 23 miles in their airplane and take passengers along with them. Now, I, I should tell you that, that the development of the airplane is one of the things that America will legitimately be remembered for uh, forever. I mean, this is one of the great, most important uh, things that America accomplished in its history, in my opinion. Uh, by the way, Americans were not particularly interested in developing flight. It, uh, the, Fr the French will become interested in this. And the French government will invest heavily into, into airplane technology and take Orville and Wilbur's work. And, and it, most of the, the, the work in the next decade or so will be done in France. And the U.S. falls far behind until in 1915 we create the National Advisory Committee on uh, 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 Aeronautics, I believe it is, um, uh, to put government money into developing flight in America. There is no attempt at all at commercial flights uh, until after Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic in the 1920s. Uh, it is strictly used to do things like deliver goods and primarily mail, that, that, and, and then hobbies is, is kind of showing off. But the greatest invention was inventing. Uh, research and development, it came to be called. Uh, the government was actually subsidized this quite a bit in the beginning, and General Electric uh, created the first corporate research and development lab. These were people whose full-time job was to come in and invent things or improve currently existing things. When the government began to withdraw funding and it became uh, almost entirely corporate funded, uh, the focus went from exploration and just kind of learning science and figuring out what was going on uh, with the world to developing very specific products. Uh, in, in the world of science, this is the fight between the scientist and the engineer. The scientist wants to pursue curiosity and understand things, and the engineer wants to accomplish a specific function. Uh, the practical uh, side represented by the engineer versus the theoretical side represented by the scientist. The scientific approach wasn't just for devices and machines, it was for the very working of the factory or the industry itself. Uh, the, uh, this notion of scientific management pioneered by a man named Taylor, so we call it Taylorism, uh, said that you should give every worker a simple, endlessly repeatable task and have them specialize in doing that. This task should require no skill, so you could replace these workers easily. You could just simply hire one and replace them with somebody else. Uh, because of this, you wouldn't have to pay them very much. And so profits go up, wages go down, and job security for the workers go down. Now this culminates in 1914 when Ford takes these ideas and creates his moving assembly line. Cars come by on a conveyor belt and a worker stands in one place and does the same thing to every single car. He puts the the uh, side view mirror on or what I don't think they had those but whatever he puts one part on the car he turns one screw um, and, and in this way Ford was able to produce a whole lot more cars uh, for a lot less money. He was in fact able to cut the hours his workers worked produce more cars and at the same time raise their wages. We can see this in the price of cars. In 1914 a Model T cost $950 by 1929 it cost $290 Another side effect is all these increasingly complex factories required enormous amounts of electricity. And this is what's going to spur the creation of power plants and the electrical grid, uh, not so you could have a light to stay up late at night and read or something. It, it's for, for business use. 